So, Luke chapter 16. Today we're going to be in verses 1 through 18, and we are going to talk about happiness. <clears throat> A lot of people believe that um, you're going to find it growing on trees or putting money into, um, you know, the lottery machines or something like that, you know, and and expect to, to be happy. But surprisingly, the people that have money and have maybe even earned more money always tend to feel like, hey, it's just not enough. In fact, you may have experienced that on your or in your own finances that, you know, if I could just get another dollar more an hour, then I'd be okay. And then you get there and then you find something else popped up and, and whatnot. And you're just like, man, that didn't make me happy. You know, I thought it would. I thought it was going to settle if I could just win the lottery. Well, the great thing is, is we did. Because happiness doesn't grow on trees. Rather, he... He hung on it. He hung on, a on the cross. And that's where our, our true happiness is going to be found. So let's jump into this. <clears throat> Luke chapter 16. Starting in verse 1. Jesus told this story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. And one day, a report came that that manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you are going to be fired. Oh, joy. You know, just what everybody wants to, uh, to hear, right? Well, about a year ago, there was a study done. <clears throat> Top 10 things people want and cannot seem to get. Guess what was at the very top of that list? Happiness. Just can't get happiness. Just can't seem to find it. But that was also backed up by the number two thing, which was money. I can't seem to get enough money. And interesting, as I went through and I looked at all of the top ten things, do you know that the majority of them with the exception of one or two that just seemed a little bit strange. Um, but the majority of them, it was all kind of heading right back towards money. If I had money, then I would be able to do all these things that would then make me happy. So that is interesting. But <clears throat> um, that's not going to make you happy. So this guy here... Um, is going to be fired. And get your report in order because you are going to be fired. <clears throat> the manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me and I don't have uh, the strength to dig ditches um, and I'm too proud to beg. So, yeah. You remember Donald Trump used to be on that television show. You're fired, you know. And uh, I don't even remember. Was it The Apprentice or something like that? Yeah. So... Anyhow, he's, he's too old in this picture to go out and dig ditches. He's too, he's too far along in age. Um, he's, he's not talking to a young man. He's talking to an older um, person here. And he's too haughty, too proud to go and beg um, for his money. So being that he apparently seems to be a deceitful and dishonest um, gentleman, in verse 4, he says, ah, I know how to ensure that I will have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I am fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much money do you owe him? And the man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. That's <laughs> It's a lot of olives and a lot of oil. So he said, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. Wow, 50% off. That's great. And how much do you owe me to the next one? I owe him a 1,000 bushels of wheat. 
was the reply. Here the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. Who can do the math? What percentage off there? 20%, right? So, sale! I think everybody likes to see that sign. Up to 50% off here is, uh, you know, is what's going on. <laughs> and then in verse 8, the rich man had to admire the... Uh, the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. That's not really quite the word that is really rendered there in, uh, in the Greek, but it's close. Say, wow. You know, if you're going to be dishonest, at least be thinking ahead, think towards the future. And that's exactly what this dishonest <laughs> guy did. He said, you know what? <laughs> Before I am fired, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some people some discounts. Because then... When I am fired, I can say, hey, remember? Remember that money that I was able to save you? That product that I was able to save you? You, you need to help me out, or could you help me out? <clears throat> it seems to be kind of a, a bit of a scam, right? But at least he was being shrewd, is what um, the, uh, the employer said. Well, I have to, have to hand it to you, you are being shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world think that way. The children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. Being shrewd is not necessarily a good thing when it incorporates dishonesty. So, here, <coughs> the, the Lord is simply saying, you're not of the world. I want you to be different. I want you not to be as the children of this world. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, the Lord talks about having a change of heart and a change of mind. He says this, Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to change your mind. You've got to renew it. How do you renew it? You take whatever's in it, you get rid of it, you play, replace it with something good, decent, and right. How does faith um, How does faith brew up, in a sense, in our lives? By hearing the word. Faith increases when we put more into our, our brain and into our heart. And so that's really what he's talking about here. Then you will be able to test and <coughs> approve what is um, God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So how are you going to know what God's will is in your life? A lot of people ask that question. Well, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. I, I'm in a financial hardship here, or I'm going through some difficulty that I just, I don't know what to do. I, I, I just, you know, if I could just win the lottery, and then I just got fired, you know? <laughs> No, the answer is to go to the Lord. Renew your mind. Say, Lord, maybe there's something that I'm doing that's dishonest, or maybe there's something that I'm doing that really I, I should be, but, but I just need help getting there. The best thing to do, sit down, pray, open your Bible, and let the Lord lead you to that position where your mind is changed. And then when our mind is renewed, we're going to know exactly what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. And though the manager here was dishonest, he was still preparing for his future. And in this story, the worldly employer, in a sense, um, kind of gives him a little... Um, uh, a little commending, a little, you know, hey, at least you're smart and you're trying to think about your future. Well, <clears throat> is it hard to give away money? Yes and no. It's both answers are true, right? <clears throat> there are times when, um, yes, it's hard for me to give away money. I lost the key to my wallet um, and, you know, or I'm sorry, I only carry plastic, um, you know, that kind of thing. But then when you do have it and, and you know somebody is in need and you want to help them, it is such a, a 
amazing feeling to be able to reach out and meet somebody's need just as much as the Lord has met our need in a sense and just say, wow, you know, um, does that mean that we just hand money out to every single person that's holding a sign on the corner? No. The Lord asks us to be children of the light, but to be not so much shrewd as it, as it is being led. Lord, what is your will in this situation? There's this person here. Are you wanting me to meet this need? Is, is my direction from you that which is going to help them out? help them up, so to speak. And in those times, man, to be able to just give them some food or to, to hand them some money, but then also to put your arm around them and pray for them and say, hey, I'm going to pray for you this week and ask that the Lord will meet your needs and really meet you where you're at. It can be hard, but it can also... Um, <coughs> can also be very easy. Why does the Lord ask us to give in the first place? Any ideas? How selfish are we? Just turn on the news, right? You know, we can see just how selfish we can really be. Why then would the Lord, if we are selfish, ask us to um, to give away? And it's really one of those things that uh, he's helping us to become less selfish. And that's really what it is. It, it sounds a little backwards. So you want me to give it away just so that I can get rid of my selfishness. But, you know, that's, that's why he asks us to do those things. Sometimes what the Lord asks us doesn't always make sense. Well, if I had more money, then I could help more people. And the Lord isn't interested in how much we have. He's more interested in what kind of a heart we have. Are you willing to listen? Are you willing to obey me when I'm asking you to, in this area of giving, in this area of, of selfishness that I'm trying to help you correct? You know, I, I want you to be able to give more. But until you do that, then until you're willing to start, in a sense, then... I'm, I'm, we're stuck, you know. I can't really do much. Yeah. Always have an issue with giving. Uh huh. But when I do, I really feel good. Absolutely. <laughs> I, 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 back and forth, back and forth. Uh, is this really the Lord telling me to do that? And then once I do, I know He's stuck in that area. Yep. Absolutely. It, it, uh, it, it is hard not to be selfish really is. I can remember a time when in my life I stopped um, tithing. And I don't want this to necessarily be a tithing message, but <clears throat> as an example, um, I had looked at the money that I had been giving to God and said, wow, I could spend that on me. I mean, literally, that is exactly what I was thinking in my mind. I could spend that on me. And I did. I started getting toys and little things and whatnot, but then I found myself in such tremendous debt. It was it was unreal. And I can remember asking um, a gal out that uh, worked um, in the office uh, above me there at the bank in, in Phoenix and sent flowers, you know, nice little letters. And the answer kept coming back, no, no, no. Um, and I'm just thinking, man, this is, this is different for me. And then I found out um, that her dad was putting on a class, how to manage your money from God's point of view, from God's perspective. And I thought to myself, you know, if I go and I take the class and I can impress dad, then maybe dad will say something to daughter and he'll say, hey, here's a nice, young, put-together man. Why don't, you, why don't you go out with him? And though my intentions were, in a sense, dishonest, God still used those in order to lead me into a position of sitting down in front of him and saying, you know what? 
you're doing this the wrong way. And as I sat there in the class, you know, I, I just was blown away because I was reminded once again what the scripture says, what the Lord, the leader of my life was telling me. You're, you're going in debt because of the fact that you're, you're not giving. You're being selfish. And I can remember going out to my truck and saying, Lord, I can't pay back what I've taken from you. I can't, I don't have that kind of money. In fact, I'm right now barely being able to keep my head above water by a few dollars. I don't know how I'm going to even begin to tithe. If I start tithing, I'm going to be out of money and I won't be able to pay my bills. And I can remember him just saying, just do it anyway. Don't worry about the past, because can you change the past? No, you really can't, can you? So there's no sense arguing about it. So he says, I want you from this point forward, I want you to do what you know is right. Do what I am telling you to do. And so I said, okay. And I was shocked. I would pay my tithes, and I every month, though the, the numbers didn't add up, I had money to pay my bills. And it was an amazing thing. The Lord really taught me in that, that when I am willing to give up my selfishness, he can work wonders. He can work miracles. So don't let money, don't let things, don't let time that we are supposed to be giving to the Lord, you know, become that which actually binds you up, that which actually causes you to be locked up and the potential that God has for you in your life. So, <clears throat> moving on, he says, I say to you, <clears throat> make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, you may uh, receive, or they may receive you into an everlasting home. Now, I have both <clears throat> versions up here because I really do, uh, I really do like what the Lord says here. Um, at the beginning, he says to use money, mammon is, is really the, the term that he's using there. Um, use it to make friends. It's unrighteous. Why is money unrighteous? Well, who created it? Man did. God didn't put Adam and Eve in the garden and then hand them a bank account. You know, he didn't just say, well, here you are. He said, I've, I've created all of this for you. This is all for you. So he calls it here unrighteous mammon. Why? Probably because it's a manipulative kind of uh, situation. In fact, the Hebrew word um, for mammon means that in which one puts one's trust. Where is my trust? You flip over the dollar bill and what's it say? In God we trust. But yet, it's you know, sadly, that's not the case, is it? it? It just hasn't become that. So riches, depending on them for happiness, will actually rob us of our happiness and can even put our salvation in jeopardy. Wait a minute. Are you saying that if I chase after money, if I chase after those things that I can get, hang on to and hold on to that somehow I could lose salvation or my position with the Lord. He sure seems to say that in the scriptures. He says um, here in just a minute, we'll go into that. But in first Timothy six, verse 10, he says for the love of, of money. This is probably one of the most misquoted verses of all time. Money is the root of all evil. No, it's not. It's our heart that is really the root. But it's my love. Where does my love come? From my heart. Okay? It is the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. They've wandered away from that which they had found to be that thing that makes them whole. We're all chasing after something that's going to make us happy. 
But that happiness is only going to be found in the one that stretched out his arms and died on the cross for you and I. It's only going to be found in Jesus Christ. You can never have enough money or drugs or sex or stuff in general. There is always something there that leaves us empty. It never fulfills. It's never enough. And yet God is that thing that is enough. On to verse 10. He says, if you are faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in larger ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, <clears throat> won't you be dishonest with a greater responsibility? The answer to that is hypothetical. <laughs> yes. If I'm dishonest with the little things, then I will be in the big one. How many of you have ever stolen something? Oh, good. I'm glad to see that you're honest. Even if it was just a pencil off somebody's desk, right? <laughs> but the thing is, is that makes us all thieves. How many of you have told a lie? Okay. You know, I mean, we could go through the whole Ten Commandments and we would find that we have broken every one of them. But the great thing about it is, is we serve a Lord that did hang on the cross and did forgive us of our sins and says, I'll show you true happiness. And it isn't found in those things. Verse 11, and if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches of heaven? Now, is he talking about heaven up there or literally the heaven that we have right here on earth? Because with Jesus, my life is way better off than it could ever be. I have, in a sense, a piece of heaven with me at all times. And so <clears throat> he's saying here, look, if, if you can't be trusted with worldly things, then how can I do anything with you in a heavenly sense, with heavenly wealth? If God has blessed you financially, or blessed you with a lot of time, or blessed you with a lot of stuff, Hey, give him the opportunity to use that in your life and in the lives of other people. Because what happens when you die? Where does that money go? <laughs> it goes to whoever. It doesn't go with you, does it? Okay? That stuff doesn't go with you. Okay? We don't actually own it. It's all basically going to be passed along as we move along in life. And if you are not faithful with other people's things, then why should you be trusted with things of your own? Boy, if we are constantly feeling like we need something more, then we've really missed the mark. God is saying, look, here, if I can't trust you with what I've given to you, then there's probably the answer in the question. The answer is found right there. I can't trust you because you're not being faithful. What does it mean to exhibit faith? Is it just saying the words? Is it, is it just believing in my head and in my heart? No. Faith is one of those words that, that actually means to put it into practice or to put it into action. If I have faith that the Lord will meet my needs, if I'm trying to meet somebody else's needs here, because he's, you felt like he's told you to do that, then do it. And don't worry about it. Do it. Bless that person and let the Lord then meet your need later on. <clears throat> no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be literally enslaved to money. I couldn't help myself. Star Wars, you know, it's a great example. You got Darth Vader, the dark side, and then Yoda, the good side. And what was Luke's battle? His whole battle was, which one am I going to follow? And I'm going to follow my worldly father, or am I going to, um, you know, move in this direction of godly goodness? Now, I know they don't come right out and say that, but hey, that's what, you know, that's what I in a sense, take out of it. But the Pharisees, who dearly loved their money, don't you like that? 
Mm. That, that expressive word there, dearly. They dearly loved their money. That's going to be kind of a key term, so hang on to that in your mind. They dearly loved their money. They heard all this and they scoffed at him. And then he said to them, you like to appear righteous in public, don't we all? <clears throat> you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your heart. You can't ever cheat your way through this life because God knows everything. <clears throat> what this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. So does God want my money? No. Then why does he ask me to tithe? Why does he ask me to give to people? Why does he ask me to meet the needs of other people when I see them? Why does he say in his word that if you see somebody that is hurting, then help. If you see somebody that is hungry, feed them. If you see somebody that is thirsty, give them drink. Because if you're doing that, you're doing that to whom? To the Lord. So, <clears throat> the world honors riches and seeks to gain them, but God honors those who honor Him. That being said, when we talk about Israel and God using them and them being in a position where they didn't really want to, they wanted to honor the Lord, but they also wanted to be worldly. In, um, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, not only does God know the hearts of Israel, but he also knows what will make them happy is what Samuel was trying to tell them. And yet, Jesus brings this up here, and perhaps when he was speaking to the Pharisees, they may have even remembered that particular um, book of the Bible there in Samuel. But he says here in verse 16, until John the Baptist, the law of Moses and the message of the prophets were your guide. Notice that he didn't say, and the law that you created was also your guide. He said what? John the Baptist and the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, okay, uh, were your guide. But now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is eager to get in. But that doesn't mean that the law has lost its force. Just because Jesus came and said, look, you, you really are not able to fulfill the law. And so you're all sinners. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stretch out my arms. I'm going to die for you in your place. I'm going to let uh, you be forgiven of all of your sins, both past, present, and future. I'm going to forgive them all. And all you have to do is just follow me. Let me be that guide. This is the new thing. And the people were into it, but the Pharisees were not. They liked the law. They loved the law. That was their tool in order to manipulate even the people. And so what does he say to them here? He says, I want you also to know that even though there's this abounding love, the law isn't gone. The law still has all of its force. What was the law's job? To convict us. Exactly. To convict us and to point out that we're sinners. Yeah. If I said, hey... Um, if I said, hey, uh, Floyd, you got mud on your face. You'd say, no, I don't. Well, you might say, yeah, I probably do. But <clears throat> for the sake of this story, you say, no, I don't. You say, go look in the mirror. And you go and you look in the mirror. The mirror is, in a sense, that law. Because then you can see, wow, yeah. I am dirty. I am contaminated. Yeah. When we read through the law, we realize that we're failures, that we're sinners. But what is the salvation that's listed there? There's not. If you keep the law perfectly, then you could, then there's there's not a problem. But if you could if you could have done that from the get go, then you didn't need it. God wouldn't have needed to to give it. But the Lord needed to give us a mirror so that we could see the mud, the dirt, 
the gunk that's in our lives and in our hearts. That's what the law is. Just because he came and died on the cross doesn't take away from what the law says. I still need to point out and look at my sin. I still need to see that. I still need to know that I'm a sinner. But the great thing is, is I also don't just look at the, at the mirror the whole time. I also look to the cross because that is is where my forgiveness is found. Yeah, Dickie. And, and a lot of people don't realize the law didn't go away exactly like you said. Mm -hmm. Those who haven't accepted Jesus Christ, Christ will be judged by the law. Mm -hmm. And there's absolutely no way they can come up clean without Christ. Very, very true. So the law didn't disappear. It's still there. Yep. It will be in effect for all those who don't have Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing is, is you actually buy back your own sin if you don't accept that invitation that we talked about a couple chapters back. So, knowing this, God, um, Jesus continues to say here, but that doesn't mean that the law has lost its force. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the smallest point of God's law to be overturned. It's not. It has to be there in order to show my sin. So then how does it get overturned? It doesn't. The law in Colossians got nailed to the cross. <clears throat> when we think about the idea that Jesus was presenting to the Pharisees and thinking about Samuel and the, the prophet there that God had given to them and yet they rejected his word. Look, I am here as a prophet to, to come and to show you God's will, but you don't really want me. So who do you want? Well, the world has kings. We, we want a king. Give us a king to lead us and then we will obey. Then we'll follow what the Lord asked us to do. Okay, who do you want as your king? Well, there's a really good looking, tall young man over there whose name is Saul. We want him. He's pretty smart. What was the outcome of that? There's a lot of things that we think are going to make us happy. There's a direction that would seem right. Lord, if you would just do this, if you would provide here, if I could just win the lottery, then everything will be okay. There is a direction that seems right to a man, but the end there leads to death, as um, Solomon would say in the Proverbs. Well, for example, Jesus continues, a man who divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery, and anyone who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, this is interesting. Weren't we just talking about money? Oh, where did this come from? Lord, um, why are you bringing up divorce here? Let's think back to who he's talking about. He's not just talking to the people. But what did he say about the Pharisees? They dearly loved their what? Their money. Do you know that they had a law that if... A woman, a wife, salted your food too much that you could divorce her. If she burnt your food, then you could divorce her. If even there was a prettier woman available, then that was a legitimate reason then to give your wife a bill of divorce. It is amazing to me how come people don't get married anymore. And I would suggest to you that probably one of the biggest reasons they don't do it is because of the tax law. Well, if I stay single, then I can claim head of household. But then this person over here can go and claim and we can get all this money. It is amazing to me how many people will jump through a worldly hoop, but they won't bow down to what the Lord's will is. They'll bow down to the worldly law, but not God's law. And as a result, 
when it comes right down to it, there's no real connection. Because you can walk away at any time. Where's the commitment? You can walk away at any time. Well, I don't want to get married, especially in California, because the law of California says that if I am married and I get a divorce, then half of everything I own goes to my wife. Why are you thinking that in the first place? You're not even married and you're already thinking about divorce? That is one of those words that in marriage should never come up. Just do not say the D word. Don't do it. It's not easy because we get angry, we get frustrated. But what does this have to do with my happiness or what Jesus is talking about here regarding finances? What has this got to do? Well, the Pharisees loved their money as we read there in verse 14. They were, <laughs> they were dearly um, in love with it. They loved it a lot. And that's when money became more important to them than relationships. That's when they became enslaved to it. When their relationship with God was tainted, so was their marriage. When they gave their heart to the Lord initially, they were probably excited and overjoyed, but something snuck in. Some chains that bound them up. And they let it sacrifice, or they sacrificed rather their relationships rather than, than letting go of their selfishness. It became more important to them, and their relationships suffered. <clears throat> but isn't marriage here, isn't it just a piece of paper? In the state of California, isn't it just a piece of paper that says, I'm married okay. to, yeah. okay? <laughs> or that certificate that we handwrite our names on and hang up on the wall for a while. <clears throat> isn't it just a piece of paper, yeah. as I've heard so many times? Yes, it, it is a, a piece of paper. But so is a $100 bill. <laughs> and yet, if we see a $100 bill blowing in the wind, what are you going to do? I'm going to chase after it. I'm going to grab hold of it. I'm going to hang on to it. And I might have to wrestle somebody for it. So I might be fighting for it as well. So the reality is if we will do that for a lousy hundred bucks or a piece of paper or when we talked you know, um, about giving things up. Would you give up your cell phone for $100,000 a, a week or so ago? You know, I mean, <clears throat> it is amazing how quickly our mind leaves the Lord and we want to chase after that thing that, that we think is going to make us happy. When in reality, the thing that's going to make us happy is the Lord. David, who, had a, who was named the man after God's own heart by God himself, said this in Psalm 1, blessed or literally happy. When you see the word blessed or blessed in the scriptures, it means happy. Happy is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, his dear love, is the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate on it day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Happiness doesn't grow on trees. He hung on one. That's where my love, that's where my joy, that's where my peace is going to be found. Is when I give my life, my stuff, everything to the Lord. And just say, Lord, I want you to lead me. Where do you want me to give? Where do you want me to serve? What time 
do you want that is that's mine that that I could give Lord help me to be less selfish I want to be more like you I want to be that tree that's planted by the streams of living water because if we're not we're not going to be fruitful life is not going to be much of a blessing to us at all my delight needs to be in the Lord and in his ways. Amen. Well, Lord Jesus, I pray that we would find our delight in you, in your law. Father, we couldn't keep the Ten Commandments. And so when you came and you died, you gave us just two. You said, then just do these two things. I want you to love me with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. And the second thing I want you to do is love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And Father, we love ourselves. We brush our teeth, we comb our hair, we stuff our faces full of food. We make sure, Lord, that we're having fun. Father, we are and can be such a selfish person people but father you said if we're going to be like you we need to stop worrying about stuff if we're going to find true happiness lord we need to look to the cross we need to follow your ways and father i am so grateful to be the pastor of this church where i see it all the time lord you have blessed each one of these folks we live in such a giving community. Lord, this, it's unbelievable the things that have been accomplished here for such a small handful of people. And Father, I pray that we would just continue to love, continue to be that light, continue to serve you in a way that would be pleasing in a way that would bring not just happiness to ourselves, but Father, to live in a way that would bring you joy and that would lead others to the joy of salvation. So Father, I pray that you would reach down into our heart and that you would write this on the tablet of our heart today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I don't ever believe in coincidence. I believe that where we're at in the Word is where we're at with the Lord. You know, it's, it would be easy for me to go and just pick out a topic and just say, oh, we're going to talk about this. Sadly, the church does that. One of the most taught um, passages in Scripture is it's more blessed to give than it is to receive because... It's all about money, 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 right? But that's not it. As you and I go through the word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, what are we going to find? The full counsel of God. And I don't think it's a mistake that God has put us in chapter 16 for this week. So look for those opportunities to look around you and say, Lord, what is it that you've given to me? that I can bless you with by blessing others. If it's my time, great, I'll give it. If it's something that maybe I don't need anymore, then give it. If it's a financial blessing, great. But the important thing to do is to remember what the Lord said there in Romans 2. Be transformed in our minds. Let the Lord write his law in our hearts so that we have a change of mind and we're not just doing what the rest of the world is chasing after which is emptiness it's empty hundred dollar bills blowing in the wind you know you can't catch it especially in a tornado okay. so lord bless you have a great week look for those opportunities to serve the lord and love other people god bless you